So today we're going to talk about the periodic table. The periodic table, most of all, is a tool. So just like a hammer and a table saw, if you don't know how to use those tools and I asked you to build a house, one, your house is going to be crappy, and two, you'll probably cut off your own hand with a table saw. You're not going to cut off your hand with the periodic table, but like any other tool, it's only useful if you know what to do with it. So the major question that we're going to answer today is how are the elements arranged on the periodic table? And we talked a little bit about it last class when we talked about which ones go up and down and which ones go across. But before we get into eighth grade, let's jump back into sixth grade. In sixth grade, you talked about metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals, in your little picture here, are colored in blue. All of your metals are good conductors. They are ductile, which means they are able to be stretched into a wire, or malleable, which means I can hit it with a hammer, and it's just going to like flatten or bend its shape. They are usually shiny, which means they have luster, and they're mostly located on the left side of the periodic table. Notice that left is kind of relative because it's not like we like cut the periodic table in half. It's more like we cut the periodic table in like three fourths instead of in half. But metals are on the left side. Nonmetals are colored in green in this picture. They are basically the opposite of everything metals. So metals are good for conducting heat and electricity. Nonmetals aren't. So we call that a good insulator. Instead of being able to be stretched or bent with a hammer, nonmetals are just going to break. They're very brittle. Metals are shiny and nonmetals are not, which means they're dull or they lack luster. And they're on the right side of the periodic table. And then we have metalloids. Metalloids are that little area in between the metals and nonmetals. They are on that dark, stair steppy kind of line that separates metals on the left and nonmetals on the right. If it's a metalloid, it is going to touch that stair steppy line. They kind of have the properties of both. So they could be shiny, but brittle. Or they could be a good conductor, but breakable. With electronics, you hear about superconductors or semiconductors, and those are usually made of metalloids. So last class, we talked about the up and down groups having the same number of valence electrons. Those up and down columns of the periodic table are literally called groups or families. They are numbered across the top, 1 through 18, and all of the elements in the same group have similar properties. We know they have similar properties because they have the same number of valence electrons. There are a couple of groups that have special names. Now you're not going to have a test that says, like, what is this? But it's a good idea to have a general idea about some of those names because I have seen on a test it says something about gases. Well, if you could remember the noble gas group, that would have made that test question a lot easier. The first group is the alkali metals. And you already know this because I showed you a video before about alkali metals reacting in water. Now, technically, hydrogen is not a part of this group because hydrogen is a non-metal. But we stick it over there with the alkali metal group because, like lithium, sodium, potassium, and the rest, hydrogen has one valence electron. So it has more in common with them, even though it's a non-metal and they're metals, than it does if we stuck it somewhere else in the periodic table. Sometimes you'll see under hydrogen on periodic tables a dark line, just like the stair-steppy line, and that's to separate hydrogen from the metals underneath it. Your second group is called the alkaline earth metals. All of those elements have two valence electrons. There's a really big group in the middle. The really big group in the middle is called transition metals. In eighth grade, we kind of pretend they don't exist. The reason we pretend they don't exist is because unlike the other parts of the periodic table, it's not 
perfectly clear how many valence electrons they have. And that's why they're called transition metals. Sometimes they have two valence electrons. Sometimes they have three. They could have sometimes even four. So the transition metals, we kind of just um, don't do those in eighth grade because they get a little complicated. You're going to deal with it later whenever you do chemistry. The next group you need to know is the halogen group. The halogens have seven valence electrons. And we've already talked about chlorine and fluorine a little bit in class. And lastly, we have the noble gas group. The noble gas group, remember, has a full outer shell. And so they are non-reactive, completely non-reactive, 100% stable, not going to form compounds easily. So I talked about valence electrons, and let's make it really clear on the periodic table that you're going to use on the star test. This is what the top of your periodic table looks like. Remember, the groups are the up and down, and I just showed you the group numbers 1 through 18, and you can see it across the top here. But there's a special number underneath that, and if you look underneath that, you'll notice the 1a, 2a, skip across over to here, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, 8a. That a number tells me how many valence electrons are in that group. So if I look at nitrogen right here, nitrogen, I can tell based on where it is, has five valence electrons. I don't need to like put two on the inside shell and put the rest around the outside shell. No, because it's in group 5A, it has five valence electrons. Remember what I said about transition metals and how we're going to like pretend that doesn't exist? Notice down there with transition metals, they have B numbers. So don't use that for your valence electron numbers for 8th grade science. We're only going to use the A numbers for 8th grade science. It's called the periodic table because there are periods on the periodic table. When we're saying period, we mean something that repeats over and over again. And you should have realized last class, whenever you were arranging your little pieces of the periodic table, that it goes 1 through 8 on valence electrons and then repeats 1 through 8 on valence electrons and then repeats. And that's what the periods are on the periodic table. It repeats that reactivity over and over and over again. So the rows across are called periods. They are numbered 1 through 7. And if you look on your periodic table that you can use for the star test, it has a convenient little number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 down the side. All of the elements in that row will share the same number of shells in the electron cloud. So, just to reiterate, the number of energy levels or shells is equal to the period on the periodic table. Right now, there are no elements that contain more than seven energy levels. In summary, the periodic table is arranged by atomic number valence electron number, and the number of shells. And I can find any element on the periodic table and automatically tell you how many protons, electrons, valence electrons, and energy levels are in the electron cloud. The up and down columns are called groups, and they match the valence electron number. I can find that on the periodic table by looking at the A number on the official periodic table we use for the star test. The left-right rows on the periodic table are called periods, and that tells me how many shells are in the energy level. And then don't forget, there's that dark stair-steppy line that separates the metals from the nonmetals on the periodic table. And remember your sixth grade stuff about what makes a metal and what makes a nonmetal.